Welcome to Disclosing New Production in the Hygiene Operatory. My name is Irene Yanku. I'm a restorative dental hygienist and practice owner in the city of Toronto. And I'm very excited to be here with you today to ask you one very important skill testing question. Is there a connection between systemic inflammatory diseases, periodontal disease, malocclusion, and caries? You're probably rolling your eyes and thinking, yes, lady, we already know this. We've been talking about it forever. And you're right. There are 39 trillion bacterial cells that live in the body, 100 trillion bacterial cells that are in the microbiome. And fun fact, there are multiple microbiomes. Your mouth is one, your gut is one, your hands, your armpits, anywhere with a secretion factor to it is considered to be its own microbiome. So what does that mean for the mouth? Well, there's between 100 to 200 species that live in the mouth at any given time. Individuals that practice good oral hygiene may have between 1,000 to 100,000 bacteria living on each tooth. Less clean mouths have somewhere between 100 million and 1 billion bacteria on each tooth. So in our practices and in our country, what are we seeing? 92% of American adults have had caries in their permanent teeth. And according to the CDC, we've got some staggering statistics about those living with untreated tooth decay. Uh, children between the ages of two and five having decay in their primary teeth at 28%, and 20% of them live with that decay. An estimated 2.26 million school days and 4.15 million working days are lost annually due to dental visits or dental sick days. So what does that mean for me as a hygienist? Working in this very operatory on patients three days a week for 12 hours a day. Well, I did what I provided as a tip in another video. I wrote down every single product and every single procedure and every code associated with what I do in this op. And I structured it in order of procedure type, like periodontal therapy or software that I use, orthodontics, caries management and risk assessments, any tools for oral cancer screenings, and so on and so forth. I created photos attached to each one of those procedures hyperlinked. So I know if I see a case like this, exactly what science tells me to recommend. I don't have to sit and hum and ha because I've already done the research on the back end and calibrated my team so that we all know if we see generalized inflammation like this, if we see an implant that's starting to demonstrate threads and we've got clefting of the tissue, if we see a localized pocket that's bleeding significantly, we already know the other patients and the other procedures that we've done that has created a successful outcome, even for patients like this, that perhaps were referred to perio, had crown lengthening, refused other treatment, and now are coming back to us for maintenance. This patient, Lindsay, came in telling me that she thinks that her teeth look long. She was referred to me by another clinician from another practice that had her hands full and didn't know what to do next, didn't have the capabilities, the technology, and frankly, wasn't comfortable with the outcome. Now, I came from a perio background. I worked in perio for four years as a surgical clinician and performed procedures under flap, which is very different than what we do in general practice. So how do we fix the perhaps unfixable? This image is great, and there's a video attached to my Instagram that shows me scaling this one tooth for 33 minutes. Every time I put that sickle on the tooth and my Gracie subgingival, I came back out with more inflammatory tissue, more calculus, more plaque, and more biofilm. And at one point, I wanted to call the time of death, but I didn't. So how do we fix this from the beginning? Well, maybe it's not as easy to fix, but it definitely is easy to identify. First, you need to see it. Not every single patient in our practice comes in with plaque built up like this. This is obvious. It's easy to see. We can tell why uh, we've got extra plaque and calculus on that upper right quadrant because we're missing teeth on the lower right dentition. But what if it wasn't as easy to see? And what if we did this simply for a conversation? This is one of my favorite procedures to perform and to hold a hand mirror and tell my patient 
that the reason why we're seeing these white spots on your teeth or fillings that aren't lasting is because of this biofilm. Even if it's a conversation or a site, our patient doesn't want to look at. This product is awesome. Um, no affiliation, but I think if you're incorporating this into your practice, looking at something like uh, Triplac ID gel, disclosing agent, there are multiple uh, products on the market. This is a really great tool that will tell patients what pink means, what blue means, and what purple means. And it goes from low, new plaque, perhaps a day or two old, to uh, older, mature plaque or biofilm that's greater than 48 hours. Um, and then you've got this very high sticky plaque that's blue in nature. This is the pathogenic plaque that secretes lactic acid at a pH of 4.5, and it really demineralizes teeth. Here's an easy video of how it's placed. Cool. So now what? Well, the end of that video will be at the end of this presentation where you can see what the outcome is. But what do we do? How do we have these conversations with patients to be able to explain to them why dark blue is bad? And how does that relate back to us on the carry side, on the restorative side? And what does science tell us? Well, if you look back to our textbooks, circa uh, dental school 101 or dental hygiene 101, I took this from uh, the Fundamentals of, of Dentistry textbook when I graduated my restorative program, and it tells us patterns based on science. The likelihood of decay happening at any given point in between 12 to 21 years, and what tooth is most likely to decay. I find it fascinating when we do decay on one tooth, uh, but then leave all of the others in the area alone. The likelihood of someone having a cavity and coming back few months later, three, six, nine, based on caries or camber risk assessments, tell us that they are three times more likely to have decay on another tooth in that same quadrant, or perhaps even a different quadrant altogether. So when I ask the question, do we seal premolars, most people in my audience shake their head or stay silent. But the likelihood of uh, a premolar decaying from someone between the ages of 18 to 21 is quite high. And why is that? Well, it has to do with our diet. It has to do with the consumption of acidic foods. You know, history tells us en enamel demineralizes at a pH of 5.5, dentin at 6.5. So when we look at the things that we're consuming throughout our day, throughout our week, throughout our month, most of us are in a constant acidic attack, maybe unknowingly, coupled with fluoridation and a lack of fluoridation in many states and provinces in Canada when you look at the little stars that are on these states, these depict the lowest percentage of third graders that have decay. And what does that correlate directly with? Water fluoridation. The same states are fluoridated and monitored, which is creating a better environment. But what does that mean for the rest of the country? It means that perhaps we're seeing higher rates of decay based on a number of factors. We've looked at this pinwheel a thousand times and it's growing and changing over time, adding elements like sealants, fluoride, chewing gum, calcium and phosphate, and income as well. Now we know there are a lot of factors that contribute to decay. It's not as easy as plaque, food, time, and diet. But what we can notice is a change in the overall depiction of the mouth. I listened to a video the other day that said, a tooth that doesn't look good probably is not doing well. Sounds very simple, but it's true. When I look at teeth and when I characterize them in my chart notes, I talk about the location, the description, and the appearance of it. I don't stick an explorer in a, in a white spot lesion because I don't know if it's mineralizing or demineralizing, and maybe I'm contributing to that, um, that caries process. So looking at the chalkiness, 
is an opportunity for us to use procedures like resin infiltration or glass ionomer placement to be able to occlude those tubules and help with remineralization. So what does this mean? What are we checking for? Let me paint you a picture of what a recall appointment looks in my operatory. First thing, patient is seated, review medical dental history, take my blood pressure readings, and then I discuss the process. I'm going to use an gate that will get your lips out of the way, and then I'm gonna use a purple dye that turns your plaque purple. This will also show me things like fillings that maybe aren't doing so well or leaking underneath. Maybe you've got some form of restoration or a crown that's been in there for a long time. This will show me if maybe something's not looking so good. And then I'm going to take some photos. Doc's going to come in. We'll look at these together. But in the meantime, don't worry. When you leave here, you won't be purple. So here is a great occlusal photo of a teenager. Teenager comes in. She's not doing so great with her toothbrushing, although every single human that sets foot in my practice gets a free electric toothbrush. I know we can talk about the overhead of that later or how I recuperate those costs. But what this shows me is perhaps the future of her mouth. We can see she's got restorations on her first molar already. We can see that those restorations are not holding up as nicely as I'd like them to. I can see the extension and perhaps shrinkage of that occlusal filling or that class one filling. And then there's a class five buccal restoration that also is depicting really dark purple around it. What does this mean? Is it leaking? Is it breaking? Is it fracturing? Is it shrinking? Is it decaying? It's a great conversation to have with a patient to say, hey, we did a small filling on one tooth. You can see the distal uh, occlusal of, of this tooth that's being filled and also the lingual. It looks like it's chipped, looks like it's breaking. And it also looks like the rest of the tooth is now starting to resemble perhaps what the back of the tooth looked like before we fixed it. The likelihood of someone getting decay on the tooth behind it now, the seven at her age group of 17 is pretty high. So this tells us a lot. It's a great conversation to have with patients and it's a great conversation to have with parents that, hey, maybe it's not so much your fault, but we need to really incorporate better habits like brushing or looking at our diet assessments and what we're consuming. You remember this case from earlier today. This is her before photo when she first came in. Remember, she told me that she thought her teeth looked long. So what do I do? Well, I clean. I'm a hygienist, right? I do SRP. I enjoy it. I use my laser frequently. It's plugged in in my operatory almost all day. And I use disclosing agent to be able to identify to the patient where she should be cleaning and where I can help too. I use a device called an airflow and it looks like this where I take disclosing agent and erythritol powder and I'm able to get in and underneath up to four millimeters subgingively to remove that biofilm and even mineralized calculus. Sure, it's great for stains. We know that, but it helps long term. So these are the conversations that I have with disclosing agent. And again, if you look at the area on the lower right side, first molar, right on the root surface, there's decay. That area lights up purple. If you look at the upper left side lateral that's slightly rotated, there's a restoration there that's failing. Lots of little things that we can look at if only we illuminate it and photograph it. On the caries risk assessment side, this will depict an, a beautiful picture if someone is at low, moderate, or high risk, and it does so in a series. I take before photos, and then I also take a couple of after photos before the doc comes in, or as soon as I've finished cleaning it. My intra oil camera is in my operatory and on and ready to go. Every single photo and every single tooth are saved in a series, so I can put it up on my screen and look at them all in the same zone lower lingual wires that sometimes are my arch nemesis. All of these things assist me in figuring out what's the plan. Am I going to do nothing? Is there no treatment? Or is this perhaps a sealant tooth or a restorative tooth? Now think of sealants as your first step in your prevention. Lots of them uh, are able to absorb fluoride from outside sources. And looking at a tooth that's developing a white spot lesion under an electron microscope, you can see early signs of white spot lesion formation before the eye or your explorer can detect it. But you know what can detect it? Disclosing agent. 
it'll absorb into those areas and it'll light up purple because we know streptococcus mutants loves that disclosing agent. Putting in a sealant will also help, perhaps one that can assist with remineralization. This is a great photo of a very deep groove on an electron microscope that I am certain would be decay if not treated. And these are the types of restorations that I hate doing, where it seems to be quite small on the occlusal and then all of a sudden you're into dentin and it's into this big mushroom case. Don't be afraid of dark pits and fissures, clean them out and seal them with the appropriate material. But again, instruct the team to remember certain things like why they fail. Some of the biggest reasons why we don't place sealants in our practice is because we've got this common misconception that sealants will fail, they're just doomed to fail. Well, most of the time, it's our error. Improper application methods, uh, contamination with saliva, we're using a product that doesn't like to be in a hydrophilic environment, oils from polishing paste, I see this way too often, and recent whitening as well. It's important to look at sealants objectively and it's important to look at them as an opportunity for us to change the future pattern of someone's mouth. I love a 3M product, ClinPro Sealant. It goes on pink and it turns white. It's one of my favorite products to use and it's one of my favorite products to photograph. One last thing that I'm gonna leave you with and I encourage you to look at it um, at another time uh, is a product called Vanish XT, which is a glass ionomer. I use this on patients that are identifying with white spot lesions around the gingival margin, like Evan here. This is a photo of his teeth in a half open smile saying the word E for me to identify all of these areas that are causing this redness around the gingival margin. I dry this area off, I notice white spot lesions that are present, and I place this glass ionomer on his teeth that eventually within the next three to six months will wear away. But what it'll do is it'll occlude the tubules and it'll deliver fluoride to those lesions in order to build hydroxyapatite uh, into fluorapatite. Eventually, hopefully, fingers crossed, he'll change his patterns in tune and he'll come back a, a revived human. He's already had class five restorations on those lower teeth. You can see them on the canines and the lateral uh, on both sides. So I'm concerned that long-term, he's gonna have some struggles. And eventually this is gonna have some struggles too. Putting a, a glass ionomer underneath this plaque is gonna protect it from perhaps having white spot lesions when the ortho comes off. And don't forget things like operculums, uh, teeth with bands on them or canines that are coming from uh, outer space, so it seems, just before they go into a wire. These are solutions and production that can be found in hygiene and in many instances placed by a hygienist to free up chair time for you to do bigger procedures that perhaps will be more profitable. Thanks again, everyone, for having me. And until next time.